Welcome to the Agile Leadership and Business Agility Meetup. Uh, excuse me if my eyes dart over there. I'm, I'm uh, admitting people uh, as they arrive, uh, so uh, I'm going to keep doing that. Uh, so welcome um, uh, to, uh, uh, to a, a special meetup where I'm excited uh, about today. Before we dive in uh, to uh, what you all came here for, a little bit of housekeeping from me. So my name is Kareem. Um, and I'm uh, super glad that you can make it today. I know that we, we've got a, uh, a, a full house potentially. So uh, fingers crossed that everybody who signed up turns up and we can, uh, we can get some great interaction. Um, in terms of the Zoom etiquette, uh, my, if you could keep yourself on mute, um, obviously, unless you are speaking, um, and in which case don't. Uh, but for most of it, if you could keep yourself on mute, I know it's a, as a courtesy to the speaker, it's really great if we, uh, as much as we'd like to hear your kids in the background, uh, we'd probably like to hear David a bit more. Um, so uh, mute, uh, please, by default. Um, if you are open to turning on your camera, uh, that would be great. Um, we like to see you. We like to see whether people are smiling, uh, interacting, nodding along, uh, looking a bit puzzled. I always find that useful. So, uh, you know, show us, show us your faces if you are comfortable doing that. That would be fabulous. Um, um, I'm going to hand over quickly, but um, it, feel free to post your questions in the chat. All right, I will, I will collect those questions, and we're going to have some time for Q and A at the end. So, uh, you know, get those in the chat, and uh, they won't be missed. I promise. Uh, I'll do my best to spot them. All right. So, um, so thank you for joining. I'm going to get out of the way pretty quickly now um, and, and introduce um, introduce our speaker for tonight. I'm incredibly excited uh, to. Uh, there, there are some people whose work you reference in your in your courses, and uh, and I've I've just finished teaching uh, day one of a course of mine, and uh, this book right here is very close to hand because we've just been talking all about it, and and that is not because he's talking to us today. That would have happened anyway. So it's it's exciting for me. Um, David's been around in the uh, in the initially the agile community for a long time. He, he has been he's been giving back and and, and talking and and spreading the message of um, all of these things he's going to talk about for some time. Uh, it's made a real great impact. Um, more recently moved into the, uh, the sort of the product space and the, uh, the testing space that he's going to be talking about today. So it is my pleasure uh, to, to introduce uh, Mr. David Bland. David, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. So uh, I'm not going to share slides today. I'm going to use a, a mural board and I will post a link later on for you all so that if you want to join in and you want to hang out and do an exercise with us, you can if you're up for it. Um, I will try to keep an eye on chat, but there's a good chance I, I won't while I'm speaking and drawing here. So if you have questions, please post them in there and then we'll get to them uh, near the end of our session today. So again, uh, a little bit about myself. I'm the co-author of Testing Business Ideas with Alex Osterwalder. Um, really a, a book that came out of just a need that we kept seeing when we we were coaching teams. Uh, my background's um, a lot of agile, but also a lot of startup um, startup history with me. I joined, I went to school for design and joined a startup out of college and it was very influential in my career. Uh, my, my whole introduction to agile was about 2000, 2001, when one of our um, CT, our CTO at the time at the startup said, we're agile. That was your training. And I was like, gee, thanks. <laughs> like no pressure there. And so I probably learned some bad habits uh, at, at a startup and then eventually start digging in and learning kind of what agile was really all about several years later. And um, just just love the community. I, I've been, um, you know, trying to speak virtually now, but love going to conferences and helping folks out. Although I'm usually slanted towards the lean startup business model generation uh, design thinking kind of crowd. So anyway, a lot of what we're going to talk about today is, is about my uh, book, but also just uh, thinking behind it and how I coach teams for you all. So basically the learning objective today is, is just to help you all de-risk the ideas you're working on. Usually business ideas, product ideas, sometimes they're service ideas. But for those of you that are coaching teams, uh, I feel like this will be helpful. We'll give you some ways to frame things with your teams. For those of you that are sort of down in it as individual contributors, I feel like this will give you some, some new uh, options as far as de-risking what you're working on. And uh, basically my, my hope here is that you do not build something that nobody cares about. Uh, and so I've been a part of that. Uh, I've been on some really amazing agile teams that just efficiently and iteratively created things that nobody cared about. And it wasn't a great experience. Loved using stickies, loved stand-ups, loved pair programming, loved everything else. 
But in the end, you have to create something of value for it to have meaning. And so that's why I kind of got pulled into this line of work is I just kept getting really frustrated by that experience. Um, I do have a code of conduct for everything that I do. And it's basically the Bill and Ted code of conduct, which is be excellent to one another. So uh, when we do our exercise and if we're giving feedback or sharing out, just be respectful in tone. Uh, it's okay to have uh, healthy disagreements, but just no personal attacks. All right, so where I wanted to start is sort of back here uh, with design thinking. And um, oh, maybe I can sketch for you a bit. So basically, you know, uh, one of the, the, there's all kinds of different framings of design thinking. And the one I keep coming back to time and time again is, is this framing of desirable, viable, and feasible. And I, I first learned this, um, you know, in design school, but also you can trace that thread through IDEO to Stanford D School to Larry Keeley, to Institute of Design. It's really hard to find kind of a single um, source of truth for this. There we go. Um, basically, uh, the, the framing here at a principle level is kind of desirability. Do they want this? It's kind of a do they question. Think about the customer, your value proposition to them, their jobs to be done, what you're trying to achieve for them viability or viable which is more around the should we do this now obviously you should have some like moral compass in in business and make ethical decisions and in addition to that it needs to sustain somehow financially if you're talking about a business so whether that's me moving, moving a kpi or that's charging for it directly but this idea of should we you know is this like a hobby or is this a real real business and then feasible which is more around can we do this and i deviate a little bit from you know, IDEO and other folks here where I think they focus on technical feasibility and, and certainly in Agile, there are plenty of ways to address technical feasibility. However, the way I also try to frame this is also go beyond technical feasibility to regulatory governance policy. Is there, is there anything else that would prevent you from doing this from a feasible point of view? And so basically from a feasibility point of view, think through like uh, if you're working in healthcare, right? So here in the United States, I can't have a team that violates patient privacy laws, even though it technically works. We, we can't necessarily, you know, uh, violate that or we'll be shut down. My first startup I joined, we were transferring money. We were doing about a billion dollars of premiums a month online over the internet. We had to clear the money <laughs> through DTCC or technically, you know, it worked, but we would not have been able to sustain. So I try to be a little broader in my framing. And so when you think about all these, these kind of themes, um, it, it, it no matter what kind of company I'm working with, they seem to hold up, right? And when you start to get people in the room that can talk about these, you know, we could start talking about, okay, for desirability, right? Who, who can help answer some of these desirability questions? Well, usually you're, you're pulling in design um, and you might be pulling in research, but basically you're trying to pull in people that can help talk about the customer, their needs, um, anything around the jobs to be done, the pains, the gains, your value proposition. So there are roles or people in your organization that you should be able to pull in to help talk about some of those, some of those questions. Same thing with viability. So if you think about viability, think about who would you bring into the room to help ask some of these, like, should we questions, especially with numbers of cost and revenue. And quite often, you know, you might be bringing in folks from product, right? Uh, product owners, product managers, but you also may be bringing in um, people like from finance, because if you're looking at numbers and calculations, sometimes product folks don't always have those numbers. So being, being, being able to pull people in leadership in that could help answer some of those kind of viability questions. And then when you think about feasibility, right? With feasibility, it's often tech, right? Tech leadership, but you might also pull in legal or somebody that helps you answer those questions as well. And so there are different variations of this framing. Um, I've heard it framed as like the triad. I, I don't know where that first came from. I first heard it from Jeff Patton. I've heard Teresa Torres speak to it as well. Um, but this idea of a cross-functional leadership team, it isn't something new to the agile community for sure. Uh, and I would like for us to also talk about risk when we have this team together, because you're, you're in, you're in for a rough ride. If something's desirable, people want this and it's viable. You can do it. You, you should be able to do it. You know, you can move a KPI, 
but on the backstage, it's it's not feasible, right? It, it doesn't actually perform or can do what you're saying it can do. The same thing on the backstage. If you can build it and you build something, and yeah, you could charge money for it, it's viable, but nobody wants it, it's not desirable, you're also in trouble. And you know, also like any, you're missing one or two of these, you're going to fail in sort of a big way, not not a small way. So ideally, you know, like like any good Venn diagram, right? We're just trying to address the risk in all three. So I like this framing of design thinking because it gets away from the, I don't know, this group does this and throws it over the wall to another group, which is what I see happen sometimes with design thinking. There are some amazing firms here in the United States that have really strong agile community of practice, amazing design thinking community of practice, and they don't talk to each other. They don't, they don't actually work together. So I, I try to sort of address this by saying, let's just stay at the principal level. There's a lot of similarities at a principal level. And can we take this lens of thinking and apply it to what we're doing? So if we uh, look at kind of what my co-author created uh, back in the day, he created this thing called a business model canvas. Um, it's been around for about 10 years or more. And what we, we've done is we've sort of, um, and, and we did this in the book too, but beyond the book, um, we've been kind of weaving this kind of thinking into our coaching, right? And into our, our, our advising and consulting. So desirability and desirable often is talking about your value proposition, your customer segments, your channels, your relationships, viability. And we're talking about this kind of should we question, you're looking at your revenue streams and your cost and feasibility, you're looking at backstage activities, resources, and partners. And so I've noticed when I'm helping teams kind of fill this out, they want to take kind of a check the box mentality, but really you're going to get more out of it if you can see the relationships between things and look at your risk. So for example, you know, who are your customer segments? So basically who are those people? If you think about like the, as a user in your user story, if you use that format, um, who, who are they, <laughs> you know, what are their jobs, pains and gains? Do we have any evidence that, um, they actually have those, what's your value proposition to them? So quite often it's not just your product or service, but it's the perceived benefit thereof. So what's the value people get out of, you know, your AI or your platform or, you know, whatever that thing is, it's not about the thing so much. It's about the, the value that you provide with it. What are your channels? So think acquisition and distribution channels to get to your customer. And then what is the nature of your relationship with your customer? So think, is it direct one-on-one? -on -one? Is it personal? Is it a recurring? Is it a one-time? Like, what does the relationship look like? And then how do you generate revenue either directly or indirectly? Now on the backstage, we can talk about, okay, so what are the key activities? So think verbs that you need to do to make this work. What are the, the, the key resources. So think nouns, phys physical or digital nouns. So it could be a brand. It could be IP. It could also be literally like a factory. right? And then what are the costs incurred? And then who do you partner with? So nine times out of 10, this is a similar flow I use. And when you think about from a, almost like a systems thinking point of view, one, it's not left or right. And all this stuff is related. So if you think about how you deliver your value to your customers, like what's that relationship look like? Um, what's this bi-directional relationship you have with the customer? Okay. How do you generate revenue either directly or indirectly? And then on the backstage, your activities and resources, you can pull for them and say, okay, what are our costs? And then if you partner with somebody, you're partnering with them because they bring an activity usually that you can't do or don't want to do a resource that you don't have, or they might even create a channel for you to help you get to your customer. So if you look at kind of early stage of this tool, um, you know, Henry Chesbera has a great white paper about it. And uh, I was able to hang out with Alex. So I've written a book with him, you know, and I, I pair with him, um, getting really like back behind the scenes of why he created this tool. The early models looked like a systems thinking diagram. Now, I think some of that nuance was lost when it was created, it kind of turned into a canvas. And then people thought, oh, I just checked the box. Like, yep, I got a value prop. Yep, I got a customer. Uh, fill out all these boxes and I go build whatever I want. That is not really the intent behind it. It was more, let's visualize. So think visual management, which all of you should <laughs> really understand, right? Like half of Agile is really just like visualizing your work. And then, you know, look at the relationships because if you, let's say, change your customer segment, then what does that do to the rest of your model? Does it change your channels? Does it change your revenue stream? Does it change who you partner with, you know? And I think all this is about storytelling and it's about visual management. And it's about looking at risk. 
And so we've kind of tried to push the ideas forward since the first book. Uh, you know, Alex wrote Business Model Generation in I think it was 2010 or so. Learned a lot since then. Uh, his newer book after the one he wrote with me is, test, is um, The Invincible Company. He does a lot of pattern work about this stuff as well. I'm more focused on the testing side just because that's sort of what my superpower is. But um, I think it's really important that you, you know, are able to test your strategy and look at how things relate. So what we do is we essentially help teams kind of fill this out. And then we start writing down these assumptions about, you know, basically what assumptions do we have around desirability? You know, does our value proposition fit with the customer segment? Do they have these jobs, pains and gains? Right down here at the bottom, we start writing down our assumptions around viability, you know, that we can basically sell this at a price that uh, is profitable <laughs> for us. Uh, feasibility, it's a lot of backstage, you know, can we actually partner with these people? Can we actually do, um, you know, like achieve these activities and really acquire these resources? And so we just you get this, um, you know, th this group back here, right? <laughs> and, and some other folks, I tend to be more inclusive on this session when I'm working with teams, but getting the right uh, folks in the room and answering some of these or just writing down what some of our beliefs are, some of our big assumptions. And then from there, what we do is we start pulling these over. And so um, just kind of explain this two by two before I start pulling stuff over. It's a two by two that I've been iterating on for years and years and years. So I first um, learned this working with Jeff Gothelf and Josh Seiden, who, um, who wrote Lean UX is probably one of the best uh, things they're known for. And over the years, I just kept iterating on it to getting to something that worked for me and my teams and um, called it assumptions mapping. And so it's part of Google's um, design sprint program now. So if you go to Google site, they have this on their design sprint kit site as part of their resources. So Google uses this in, in their work. Uh, there's a lot of people. Um, I think the UK government uses this. <laughs> like there's all kinds of, uh, of uh, it's kind of just, I just put it out there um, and people just started adopting it, which was my hope is if it provides value, people would use it. And basically um, the two axes here, one is important and unimportant. So how important is this belief, this assumption um, to us being successful? And then do you have evidence or not? And it's not binary, but think of like observable evidence, qualitative, quantitative. Is there any evidence to support what, we, what we've written down here? And so what tends to happen is once you write these down, which is great, that's like step one, like writing them down, having, <laughs> acknowledging that there's space to do this, you know, kind of, kind of work. Then we start kind of dragging these over and we say, okay, well, how important or unimportant is this belief we wrote down, this assumption for us to succeed? And then do we have any evidence or not to support it? And so quite quite often what will happen, uh, and there's a reason why I use evidence now. I, if you look at uh, older blog posts of mine and videos, they'll say known and unknown and certain and uncertain. What was happening was I get these really strong leadership personalities in the room and they would put it there and they would just say, like they would put it way over here, right? And it's like, it's, I just know. And it's like, well, why do you know? And they're like, I just know. And it's, <laughs> it's like, it's a conversation stopper, right? You, when you're in a leader, like when you have a cross-functional team together and you're trying to talk about risk, you don't want these situations where people are just shutting conversations down all the time. And so finally we got to this point where it's like, okay, but do you have any evidence? It's like, well, well no, I don't have any evidence. And it's like, oh, okay. Well, then it goes over here. <laughs> like, like, do you have any observable, qualitative and quantitative evidence besides like friends and family, right? Like if you really sort of like generated evidence around this. And so what we do is we start pulling these over and what tends to happen and once you get one, it's almost like um, story sizing to an extent. You could say, is this more important or less important? And do we have more evidence or, or, or less evidence? And so what tends to happen if you're starting off early on, you have a lot of orange up here because uh, it's desirability risk. No one's really talked to the customer and it doesn't matter how amazing it is. If you don't like, if you're not solving a customer need, it usually bombs in, in a big way. Um, viability, right? We start mapping out, okay, what are our things around cost and, and, and finance, like our um, revenue streams? And then we start looking at, okay, backstage, can we do this? You know, how important is this? Usually what I find in a lot of teams, they can do anything. Uh, they could build it like well, short of time travel. Like I work with startups in space. I work with all kinds of different companies. You could do pretty much anything. It just becomes, um, you know, that's the, that's not usually the riskiest part. The riskiest part is usually over here 
with your with your customers and it varies you know when you start or when you start off it's usually a lot of orange over here and then as you iterate through this you know you learn more about your customer and it becomes more evidence you know you start having more evidence over here and then maybe other things move over or appear around pricing so it really just evolves over time um, and so the way I try to do this, it's just really a facilitated exercise to get people to focus. And we pretty much just ignore anything down here. <laughs> so I don't tell them that right away, but usually there's not a lot that ends up below the line. Um, it's usually like if you're writing down important stuff as it is, and you still end up with unimportant, like in, in relation to other things, it's, it's just don't focus on that right away. So what we tend to focus on um, like any good two by two, I guess, <laughs> is the, the top right. And so we want to focus for experimentation. We want to focus on things that are the most important, where we have the least amount of evidence to support them, because we want to de-risk the opportunity and basically generate evidence to know if we're on the right track. You know, the stuff over here, just plan for it um, and, and basically make sure you're sharing it out. But it's stuff you still have to do, right? If it's important and you have evidence, you, it still needs to be in your roadmap and in, in, in like in your backlog. But the stuff where it's really important and you don't have any evidence, you just want to be careful that you're not treating your backlog like a series of facts that you just execute and then you're you know like you're fine. There, at, at any of us have been in this industry long enough know there, there's all kinds of hidden assumptions in our roadmaps and in our backlogs. So what can we do to kind of elevate that and, and get some transparency in there? and have it shape our work. And that's essentially what I'm trying to do with, with teams I work with. And so uh, basically what we do from here, and one of the main reasons I wrote the book was, all right, so you have kind of the stuff you're worried about. So basically use, um, use those sort of assumptions to find experiments that help you address that risk. And so the way I, um, the way Alex and I, categorize these in the book, we use discovery and validation. Um, my thinking still evolving on that. You know, we'll see where it goes. <laughs> Once you get into a book, it's kind of like until the second edition comes out, that's the way it's defined. Um, we were pulling from Steve Blank's um, Four Steps to Epiphany. And, and Steve was kind of like the father of Lean Startup to an extent, like Eric Ries was in Steve's class. And that's how Steve got, you know, influenced him. And then Eric went off and wrote Lean Startup and, and all that. Um, you know, there's a lot of great stuff to pull from. And so he frames it customer discovery, customer validation. And, and we thought we want to go beyond just a customer here. We want to talk about overall discovery, overall validation. And so really what we did is we took 44 different experiments and we kind of applied a taxonomy to them and put them in a, um, a way that you could choose something that would help you make progress. And so I don't feel like there was a, any lack of list of stuff online. You know, you could find lists of stuff everywhere. And my teams were just overwhelmed by lists of stuff. You know, basically they're like, I still don't know what to choose from this list. And that was the big problem. So the way we've organized these is really from the, like a strength of evidence point of view, you're trying to go from like none to some with, with um, discovery experiments. So it's more like open-ended discovery. You know, is there a job pain and gain here for the customer? Can we do like search trend analysis to see if there's a volume of people searching for this? Um, is there any facilitated exercises we can do? Like we pulled in a lot of Luke Homan's innovation game work into here. There's all kinds of stuff you could do to see, you know, is there any like uh, signal whatsoever? And then with validation, the way we frame validation is you sort of want to go from some with your evidence to strong. And uh, we, we use this term like minimum viable product. I know it's been abused over the years <laughs> and I fully um, understand that. But, you know, what I tried to do with that conversation was, you know, let's bring it down a level, you know? So when we talk MVP, what kind of MVPs do I actually see with teams, you know, minimum viable product? And, and one is like a concierge. So think about delivering it manually. So delivering the value manually, there's a real value exchange. There's almost no tech involved whatsoever. Another one's Wizard of Oz, which is more like, it's like, it's like concierge, except there's nobody um, in, it's not obvious there's a person involved. So it's basically like concierge, but it's like man behind the curtain kind of thing. And then we have single feature MVP. So think Amazon dash buttons. 
So Amazon Dash buttons are very much like, um, you know, that button where you could just order, you know, your washing detergent or whatever. <laughs> so you would click a button and it would just uh, essentially order stuff for you. That was how they were testing out their Alexa strategy. And then mashups, which are you taking, you know, basically existing tech and you're mashing it together for uh, for a, a solution. I would say a lot of the no code movement is really a bunch of mashups now where you can take like Zapier and a bunch of other things and, and wire them together and, and deliver value. And so they're all framed desirable, viable, feasible and by cost and time, setup time, runtime, evidence strength. So it gives you a lot to choose from. So. Um, maybe just diving into one to give you an idea of sort of like how I've laid this out and giving you some, some stories here. So with concierge, you know, one of the reasons I like a concierge experiment is because the evidence strength is very strong because you're essentially testing with, um, this high, high investment costs, right? So you can deliver something and have people pay for it. And there's like a real value exchange. So, so here you could literally, you know, deliver it to them, physical or digital and, and get feedback from them and they pay for it. And so, you know, I, I see this when I work with travel software companies or travel product companies, you know, they'll do some of this, um, booking or something by just concierge first, learn what people want and then they productize it and build an app on it. Um, there's a lot of great things you can do to learn from that and generate evidence and behind the scenes, you're just kind of doing it all manually. Now, the other thing I like is it tests all three themes, desirable, viable, feasible, and then it doesn't cost a whole lot to do it. Okay. Now, usually the pushback I get on something like this is, well, it doesn't scale. And usually that's because, uh, people are like, well, I don't have time to do this. It doesn't scale. I'll just go build the whole thing and scale it and see what happens. <laughs> and so we do have to be mindful of that conversation because it sounds kind of crazy when you say it out loud that way and say, wait, we won't just do this manually by like at a, at, a, at a way that doesn't scale first, just to see, right. And to generate evidence and then use what we've learned and inform how we scale it. it we have to be careful of that conversation because we're incentivized for outputs, right. And we're incentivized for like building that thing and scaling it. Whereas in reality, we could do that. And it could still fail in a huge way. And so taking a time to say, okay, let's do it manually a little bit, learn. And then we can take what we've learned there and basically use it to help design our, our, our offering. So, um, what I thought might be fun for us, uh, I could draw and kind of sketch out stuff for you all day, but I felt like, uh, it'd be cool if we could do something together. So I'm going to get a visitor link here for you all. I'm going to put this in chat. So when you click, um, uh, just type, just hit enter as visitor. You don't have to necessarily, uh, create an account to participate in this for today. So uh, for those of you who don't have the book, what I've done for this session is I've put uh, a cheat sheet here in a way. Uh, Tendai Vicky, who's an associate partner strategizer, helped me help put this together for me. And, and basically, um, it gives you an idea of kind of what you can choose from. So for example, if you're like, hey, what's a feature stub? I don't know what a feature stub is. Well, if you zoom in, you can see a feature stub is like a small test of a feature that is just the beginning of the experience. So think like Google does this all the time where I click on something and it says, oh, we're not ready yet. And then it has some kind of survey or something that I get feedback on. They're basically, they're basically testing, okay, who, who, who saw this feature, um, this stub, who clicked on it, who gave us feedback, you know? So there, there is like a little funnel that they're testing to say, does this even make sense to put in the experience whatsoever? Because if nobody clicks on it, it could be that nobody thought that was interesting or it could be on the wrong page or it could be the wrong customer, right? Or the wrong value prop. So there are all these little nuances to everything, but, um, so there, these are categorized discovery. Okay. And then validation down at the bottom and the validation is going to feel more kind of lean startup y probably to most of you, you know, that's where we have our MVPs. Um, there's some other stuff in here like letter of intent. So that's something I do in a lot of B2B work where we'll create a one page non-legally binding contract and test with customers to see, especially like they'll say, yeah, of course I'll buy that. And then you go, okay, well, can we craft an LOI together to see if, um, we can, you know, eventually get to something where we, you know, have a purchase order. And if they're not even willing to put it in writing, there's a good chance what they just told you, they were just kind of telling you what you wanted to hear. And so just being mindful of that with regards to, um, 
another case is like, we'll go into a hospital and people are like, I love this tech. We had to use it right away in the emergency room. Okay. Can you write a letter of recommendation to your boss saying you recommend using this tech? Well, no. I was like, okay, but you just said you loved it. Like, well, I'm not going to recommend it. It's like, okay, well, how much do you love it? <laughs> like, so it's just kind of getting to that strength of evidence of it's just putting it in writing, you know? Uh, however, it is different than verbal. So what people say versus what they do, you're just trying to, to close that gap a little bit. And so uh, what I thought is you could just hang out and, and kind of check these out. But what I thought would might be interesting is um, if we created like a sequence. So one of the like two by far some of the most popular pages in the book is a spread I did that almost didn't make it in, which was I was just going through some of the teams I've coached over the years and said, hey, what's like a sequence of experiments they ran to get to something? And people love it. Like I literally, uh, when I teach at universities, people just like hold up the book and they just like hold up the shred, <laughs> the spread <laughs> on camera, uh, which is funny because it almost didn't make it into the book. Um, but my point in trying to incorporate that was, look, it, it's going to take you running more than one experiment to find value and really de-risk your idea. I haven't worked with a team where they just ran one experiment. It was a huge success and we made millions of dollars. It's always been like we ran an experiment, something else happened, and then it was, okay, can we explore that, that kind of thread? So um, I'll, I'll just try to start one here and I'll do, um, it would be a fun one for you all. Let's do AI for retrospectives. So let's say we're gonna do AI for retrospectives. Um, I'm sure somebody's already working on this if it isn't already built. Uh, it just seems like something people would do today. So let's say if I was gonna start with AI for retrospectives, um, so it's artificial intelligence applied to like retrospective notes and everything to look for patterns and gauge like, let's say um, maturity within teams and organization or something like that. I would probably still start with customer interviews because um, basically I'd want to know, okay, what are people doing with retrospectives now? If you had a series of retrospectives, let's say you had 20 teams running retros in your org, um, how do you basically deal with that data now? Um, are you making sure you're not using it against them, but you're using it to diagnose issues? Like how do you play that balance and all that? What I would probably do after that is I would do some search trend analysis to know beyond the, the orgs that I interviewed, the customers, is there anybody searching online for retrospective tools or types of retrospective problems or new kind of ways to look at the data? From there, I might do some paper prototyping to sketch out, okay, so if we were gonna build something that did like AI for like applied AI to retrospectives, what could that potentially be? And just by sketching it, from there, um, I might do an explainer video that kind of says the value proposition. Think like Dropbox or Dollar Shave Club. It doesn't mean we've built the whole solution, but it conveys the solution to people. And then from there, I'd probably do a landing page uh, with a sign up. Uh, I would probably have the explainer video in the landing page. And from there, I might do some sort of um, Wizard of Oz, where, where basically I would take uh, if people were willing to give me retrospective data, so let's say they signed up on the landing page and they were willing to provide it as like a beta program, then I would use spreadsheets to create like um, themes and, and things and insights and then deliver it back to them and talk to them to see if is that valuable whatsoever for solving a need that they have. And so the point here is kind of taking what you've learned from customer interviews that's small scale, right? That might be 15, 20 people total. And, and then use that to inform your search trend analysis, which is larger quantitative, where you could look at regions, you could use trends, you could look at seasonality, like what are people typing in Google and LinkedIn uh, and else play, like Quora, other places. Then I would use what I learned from that to sketch out what it could potentially look like just on paper, not spending any money whatsoever. From there, I might spend some money to make an explainer video that's 30 to 45 seconds long that explains what we're trying to solve and what our AI could do. From there, I might take that and put it into a landing page. And from there, I might have a call to action. And if I drove some people to that page and they signed up, I would try to deliver that, val that value manually to them. Um, there's a lot of AI now that behind the scenes is a lot of spreadsheets going on until it's proper, you know, proper AI. So it's just a way to kind of look at things. This is kind of a fun example because it's, um, you know, in your, I don't know, if anybody wants to run with AI for, for retrospectives, feel free to do so. But basically to give you an idea of a, of a sequence. 
So what I thought could be cool, for those of you who haven't clicked the link, feel free to join us. I see some anonymous turtles and stuff down here. So I was gonna give you a few minutes before we do Q and A to just look through here on the left, if there's anything that you're working on that you're willing to share, and then just double click and create some stickies about what kind of experiments you think could help you uh, de-risk the idea. It doesn't have to be as many as I did, it could just be a couple, but it'll give you a few minutes to familiarize yourself with the different ones. And if something looks really interesting to you and say, oh, I think that might help me solve for X, then just kind of create your um, sequence here underneath mine, all right? So I'm gonna set a timer for five minutes and I'm gonna play some music for you all. And then uh, if anyone's willing to share after that, we can share out. And if not, we can jump into our Q&A, all right? So I'm gonna play some tunes for you all, I'll give you five minutes. If you would like to create an experiment sequence for something that you're working on, um, then now's your time to do so and participate. All right, five minutes, here we go. I love the mural seatbelt sound. It reminds me of how I used to travel all the time. Okay, so um, who would like to share? I mean, I'll look for um, some guidance here. I think basically just uh, unmute and share what you're working on and I'll zoom in on whatever cluster you have <laughs> and you can share out with the larger group. So who, who would like to share? I was, I was hoping somebody else would, but I'm happy to get the ball yeah, rolling. <laughs> It'd be, be more interesting if uh, somebody. So I did the the Agile Digital Academy actually, um, which is 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 kind of cheap because we we kind of did this, um, but it, this was this was largely how how we did it. And um, in in short, it's uh, it takes a lot of the the training that we provide in person, and it it does an on demand version of it, right? But because it's a lot of time and effort to build that out. We didn't want to build it if no one cared. Um, um, and, and the first port of call was to speak to our sales folks and, and just to say, you know, what, what, are, what, what are, are people asking about this? And actually, if you raise this when you're having conversations, would people, are people interested? So it's kind of a step before that, really. Um, and then once we realized they were, we, we start having conversations with those people, specifically contacting those people. Um, put out a bit of an email campaign before the thing existed, driving to a, a, a landing page, talking about what it might be in a, in a brochure, um, and getting some explainer videos, and then start inviting people to buy something that we're quite clear doesn't exist yet, um, but will exist, and are people willing to, uh, to, to spend their money to give us confidence to spend the next however many months building it. Uh, it's kind of the similar flow to yours, but um, it's kind of the flow that we took with that. Yeah, thank you. I think um, there's no right or wrong flows, really. Um, it's just more of a, a frame, a mindset of how to think, right? So I, I, I keep seeing teams where they'll just run, ex like, they'll do customer interviews, and then they'll just go build the whole thing. Um, and there's so many things that you can do b between talking to customers and building the whole thing, even if it's used several sprints worth of work. So there are all these options where you can just do something that gives you a little more evidence. And um, you can take what you've learned from one thing and apply it to the next. And it's not linear, like quite often, you know, if I imagine if you got to the email campaign and nobody clicked and nobody cared, you probably would have either given up or go back, right? And test again. So it's a very iterative process. Um, and, and I'm just trying to get that point across to you all that it, it's gonna take more than one experiment usually to find something. And it, it should never stop to an extent, right? So even if you frame things discovery delivery, which is, a lot of modern agile, I think, is framed that way. Your discovery might fluctuate. It might be a lot of discovery. It may be a little bit of discovery, but it should never just be no discovery, right? Discovery is not a phase. It's very much something that you should always be doing to drive out the risk in your backlog and in your roadmap. Even if you're using something like Safe, when I go into a company that's using Safe, I'm looking at those giant epics that are coming up top where people just assume that, oh yeah, that's good. We'll just go build it and execute on it. In reality, like we didn't take the time to just like unpack the assumptions in that giant epic. And then we realized, oh, we want, some of these things we don't know if are true. Can we go test these sooner versus later and, and still work on some of the other activities? So um, I hope this is helpful to all of you. Again, I feel like Agile community gets this stuff. 
it's just more of building out your repertoire of, of things that you can do to help your teams get unstuck, you know, besides building the whole thing. So before we jump into Q and A uh, and some we're typing in chat here, um, this giant section here is all like free stuff that I, that I have on my site. If you just double click it, it opens a new tab. And so this is a bunch of stuff that is free for you to download. There's uh, like how I do mapping here. I have an experiment template. I have how I report out to execs. Um, I have trainings, like all this stuff is, is free. I even have like a, a type form you can use for assumptions where if you just type, fill it out, you can get, um, you just put your email in and it, it basically emails you all your answers. So all that is if you just double click there, that's for free for you. And yeah, my style is like, give a lot of value away from free and hopefully I can, can help you all. <laughs> so all I ask is that you don't share this board publicly um, and that we keep it within, within your meetup. So the link I gave you in chat, all I ask is just a link, go blast it on the internet. So um, kind of giving you some ideas of where I'm headed, right? It is just trying to push these ideas forward, you know, basically trying to help people focus and talk about risk and then design experiments to address that risk, whether it be agile or something else. Um, you know, I, I've just found it'd be just really unfulfilling to work in a, in an agile way and still deliver things that nobody cares about. And, and that's what kind of got me pulled into all of this. And so hopefully, um, you know, you all won't be put in that situation as well. So let's just um, maybe open it up for some questions and I can hang out with you all and uh, answer any questions you have for me about how I work with teams, about things I've seen, B2B versus B2C. Happy to share um, anything to help you all. And just unmute, I think, or raise hand <laughs> or type in chat. <laughs> Looks like we have a, a question there from uh, from Stephanie. Uh, what are you working on now, David? Oh, um, a couple of things I'm working on. Um, just personally, I, I'm working on um, a course, uh, an online course that's self-paced to help people learn this stuff. So um, I'm working on, on that for especially the assumptions work. I feel like it's evolved over the years. It's in the book, but I think still people struggle facilitating it. At least that's what I found out. So um, Working on that, I'm doing um, a three-day masterclass with my co-author Alex Osterwalder next month on testing business ideas, and it's public. It's a three-day event. It's like a conference. Uh, we have live music. It's pretty insane for for. It's not a webinar. Let's put it that way. Uh, so it's a lot of project-based work, and, and have uh, clusters of teams going through the whole program. And um, I, I just continue to work with. I, I balance between startups and big companies. So I would say it's probably like. 80% big companies, 20% startups right now. Um, I was worried that big companies would stop um, experimenting during the pandemic and they would get super conservative and, and not make any bets whatsoever. To my surprise, um, they, they haven't done so, uh, at least the ones I'm working with. Maybe it's some bias because they're seeking me out, but I, I keep working with, I spent a lot of last year in pharma, in COVID response, uh, in IoT, and a lot of it was people just realizing that things have accelerated during this pandemic and they can't sit still, you know, they, they can't just be super conservative and not invest in anything new. And so they've been trying to take what they know and what they're experts at and apply it in ways that helps like society. So it's been really, really um, interesting for me because I'm not necessarily an expert in any of those domains, um, but helping people match their domain expertise and my sort of facilitation and getting them to focus with tools has been really, really cool. So yeah, um, I work on all kinds of stuff though. It's fun. I get a, I get to play in all kinds of different industries like automotive, consumer packaged goods, uh, software, of course, uh, government. It, it's just been really awesome. Great stuff. Thanks, uh, David. We have, uh, we have another question um, from uh, Evalo and, uh, and I do apologize if I didn't say that well. Um, any, any of your big failures or learnings uh, using this approach? Yeah, I mean, uh, not all experiments succeed. I mean, it's not an experiment if it only succeeds. So 
There's been a lot of learning. Um, I, I would say the assumptions mapping stuff, you know, first when I get, I get companies excited about experimentation. So I work with a, a really large travel company out here in San Francisco. They loved experimentation, but it wasn't, it wasn't helping them de-risk some of their, their strategy. And I learned the hard way that it, it gave the illusion of progress that they were running experiments and it's like, well, surely we're learning stuff. We're running experiments. But in reality, the executive team I was working with wanted us to de-risk the initiative and not just run experiments. You know, it was great that the teams were learning, but they had to learn about something that would actually reduce the uncertainty in what we were building. And um, that's why I ended up with assumptions mapping was because I couldn't focus uh, the teams very well otherwise, just by kind of talking to them. So that's been a huge learning for me. Um, Probably my other biggest learning, and I won't name companies, but I've worked with some really, really well-known companies that tried to work this way. And, and they took this check the box mentality where it was, oh, yep, ran experiments, check. And uh, now I can go build what I wanted to build. And, and none of those stuck, you know, um, some of them been really high profile kind of failures. And I feel like it was more about the mindset, you know, like I can give you all the tools and templates in the world, but if you haven't changed your mindset at all, then I'm probably not going to help you that much. So you, you can't just say like, I'm going to check this just to get to what I want to do anyway. You have to be willing or like open to the idea of might being wrong. And it doesn't even mean you have to be data driven, but you have to be data influenced. So if the data keeps telling you that nobody cares, or this isn't the right solution, then you have to be willing to take a step back and analyze that and say, okay, how could we potentially solve this a different way? And, and I think that's when you really find out when you're working with the teams and with leadership, are they more passionate about the problem or are they more passionate about the solution? And I'm always nervous when they're, they're just passionate about the solution because that means they're probably not going to pivot away from that. And you, you, you just have to have to kind of search in the market until you find a problem to solve with that solution. And sometimes you find one and it's fine. Other times you just, you never find one or it's never a meaningful problem. And then you end up kind of frustrated and everybody around you feels like their time was wasted. So I feel like, um, you know, it's not like there's a lack of tools and templates and stuff out there today. It's much more about mindset and helping people understand that they can say, I don't know. You know, one of the things I, I do with leaders now is, is I ask them, it's like, when's the last time you said, I don't know in front of your team. And I can see this look of panic in some of the leaders saying, like, I would never say, I don't know in front of my team. Cause they might think I don't know. I was like, so what do you do instead? You just like make up an answer that makes you sound like you convinced them, you know, like that sounds even more dangerous. So there's this idea and then they go, well, I can't say I don't know all the time because they think I don't know anything. It's like, well, no, I'm not telling you to say, I don't know all the time. Like, you're, you're in a position for a reason. Can you say, I don't know in situations to understand that you're giving teams permission to kind of find their way through it with some guidance. And, and so, so much of this uh, is um, mindset of, being open to the idea of being wrong, having a vision, but testing against reality. Um, so yeah, I feel like, again, the book is super successful, right? Like it's like one of the top like 5% business books uh, last two years, but it's not about like, it's, it's like getting you to focus on what's risky, having a conversation about that and doing something to address that. It, it's very much about mindset. As it so often is, uh, thank you. Uh, Shami uh, has, has got a question. Uh, she's interested in uh, knowing, knowing how it differs between B2B and B2C. Yeah, I work with a lot of B2B companies um, and then all the startups I worked at were also B2B. Basically, a lot of the techniques, um, the principles are still the same. The techniques are a little different. Um, so for example, when you're B2B, usually people just, anytime you talk to a customer or potential customer, they just expect you to sell them no matter what you're talking about. So you have to break that framing really early on. So doing things where you can facilitate exercises and do anything where it breaks them out of this mode of they just think you're selling to them. And obviously, if you only have eight potential B2B customers, you can't burn through seven of them testing value propositions and then get to one with eight, right? In B2C, it's a very different dynamic. If your first, you know, 100, 500, 1,000 customers are confused and don't want your product, there are potentially millions more that might and B2B it's not that way. So you just have to be a little more um, thoughtful in how you get in front of them. And then basically don't just rapidly test different value props on them. You have to almost like co-create with them and make sure there's a job to be done behind what you're trying to solve for. So, um, and, and also the brand, um, 
you know, a lot of these big companies I work with are really, really nervous about their brand. And what I tend to do is we create labs brands or project brands, or in some cases, there's even like a, um, uh, a new legal entity that's a wholly owned subsidiary of the company and we'll use those to test ideas. And I think a lot of folks um, might feel like, well, that would never happen. And um, maybe I could just share, share one with you. It's not one that I worked on, but it's a pretty high profile one is, um, you know, something that GE did, which is this um, nugget ice maker. I think it's a great example. So GE appliances, you know, they kept having these conversations about, should we build this um, ice maker or not? And because GE appliances is really known for like really giant um, refrigerators and stoves and, and all that. And so they, they hadn't really, if I'm mistaken, I don't think until this point they had really created anything that would sit down on top of a counter that would be small, right? And so um, finally, I don't know how the conversation went internally, but they said, you know what, just go prove us wrong. You can have your own little like brand. So they called it first build right here. So this is a, this is wholly owned subsidiary of GE appliances. And they said, go prove us wrong. Look how much they raised. <laughs> it's like over $2.7 million for this like ice maker. I had never known, like, I don't understand the fascination with nugget ice, by the way. I don't know what it is, but uh, people are obsessed with it. I guess it's because the texture and the crunch or something. I don't know. I'm sure there's somebody on this call now that is obsessed with Nugget Ice. Anyway, what's really interesting is they ran this uh, Kickstarter, this like Indiegogo, which is like a Kickstarter crowdfunding. It's not like they needed the money, right? They just wanted evidence to build this thing. And now if you go check out their site, right? And, and this is just one of the things that they built. Um, they have this kind of cool little, you know, lab now, this little like thing where they can do prototypes and they've built other things, not just the ice maker. And when you go to buy this though, um, if I remember correctly, it used to, does it still do this? Sometimes they change things. Yeah. Look where it goes when you click on buy now. Uh, it goes to, of course they want in my, it goes to GE appliances, right? Check that out. So you can bring stuff on brand if you, you know, if it's a success, if it's not, like it's just a failed Indiegogo campaign. Who cares? You know, it, it was it wasn't leading with the GE brand, right? You can find the GE brand on here. You just have to kind of dig, right? But they have all these comments, community. You can create. So it's really interesting to me to see this evolve over the years. Um, this is just GE. I've seen Delta do this, Procter and Gamble, HP. Um, who else? There's a list. 3M. There's a list of companies doing this. Actually, I don't know if HP is. I know 3M is. Um, and I have a little list of all these because I keep seeing them. I saw the Delta Faucet one on a commercial recently. And I was like, I saw the Indiegogo for that. And sure enough, it was like a little sub brand of Delta Faucet that they tested. And then they brought it on brand with success. Um, this is how I work with Adobe as well. Um, a lot of the new apps, we use Labs brands. Adobe is really um, a really uh, interesting approach to this. Uh, and if it was successful, we pulled it on brand. It's an Adobe app. If it's not, it just kind of dies out and nobody cares. So yeah, there's, there's just amazing amount of kind of creativity going on. And so I would challenge, you know, when people say we can't do this because X, like literally GE did it, right? Oh yeah. And some is uh, Eric work. Yeah. Eric Rees work with GE. I, I also helped Eric Rees early days with uh, GE and the leadership team there uh, when they were um, back when um, uh, Jeff Immelt was, was in charge. So um, there are all these really, really cool uh, case studies now that I just don't think Corporations are not talking about them because they really don't want you to know that's what they're doing. <laughs> so, but then I speak to other corporations like, no, no, we can't do that here. It's impossible. And it's like, clearly GE figured it out, you know? So um, I, I think there's a lot of um, amazing ways you can do this and not destroy your brand. And, and I think the flip side is you just iterate internally forever, release it and it looks really polished, but it could be a complete flop because you didn't test it with customers. So there's a, there's a balance you can do. Awesome. That's very cool. Thank you uh, for for sharing that. Um, we we have a minute, so we'll we'll take the next uh, we'll take the next question. So apologies if we don't get to uh, to to your questions here. But um, uh, so Andrea, uh, what is your approach uh, when you are looking to build something that does not doesn't exist yet? More of an entrepreneurial new software uh, that goes a bit against the norm. Uh, big companies are scared to even try it until you have the whole thing built. 
Yeah, it's probably a longer answer than we have time for. I, I'm happy to spend a couple extra moments with you all. Um, basically, I use almost uh, similar to what Eric did at EGE as well. Um, if you read the startup way, uh, he mentions it there. And then I have it in the back of testing business ideas. And, and Alex touches on it in Invincible Company, which is this metered funding approach with, um, you know, I, I try to give um, like CFOs and executives a little more flexibility. So you're not spending a lot of money on something that seems risky. You're taking a metered approach. So what that means is we'll start off with just desirability testing for let's say 10 to 12 weeks. And we're testing our value prop and the customers, does it solve you know a problem? We'll take and we'll meet with a committee internally and we'll say, here's our strategy. Here are the hypotheses we tested. Here are the experiments we ran. Here's the evidence we generated and here's our recommendation and they get funding or not for the next series of experiments. So I think tying it to funding helps, um, it helps address the risk factor and it also helps them understand that you can actually take an approach here where it doesn't feel like a big risky bet. You can take smaller, place smaller bets. And, and so that's what I've been doing. Um, now it's really hard to pull off, right? You have to have the right people on the committee. Um, they have to be thinking almost like a venture capitalist or a VC, which could be really challenging. Let's say if you've worked there for 20 years and it's business as usual, you can't, you can't ask like, what's your ROI when they're just talking to customers. Right. So, um, it's been a lot of coaching needed there, but I've seen it yield some pretty interesting results. And so I try to approach this from a, let me help you de-risk this, reduce uncertainty, make better investment decisions. Just speaking the language of leadership. Um, tends to help quite a bit there, but yeah, there are some, definitely some companies trying it. I think, um, it's, it's not, um, it's not common yet, but I feel like it's just a smarter way to approach it. Um, the, the big challenge there is mindset again. And then, um, VCs tend to look at like a 10 year horizon. And if your execs are churning out every two to three years, that can make this really difficult. So if you have some stable leadership and they can take a long-term view, Basically, we say spread your bets over a bunch of different teams, like a portfolio approach, and then use metered funding to kind of find that next huge moneymaker. Alex has some statistics. I mean, it might take 150 to 200 of those, but uh, it can't just be three. And then you give up because they failed. And then you get frustrated at the people working on them. Like it, it just, it's so much mindset and long-term thinking. It's awesome. Like internal VC uh, function there. That's, uh, that's super cool. Um, we'll, uh, we will take one more, to, uh, if that's all right. Uh, it's a slightly mindful, but uh, I want to sneak this next one in. Um, when you start coaching, consulting a new company, what are the first three things slash activities you usually do? Oh, geez. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, it's not that different from what I'm doing right now. You know, I, I try to give value away as soon as possible. I mean, when I started working with Toyota, I remember sketching out a business model canvas with them on their whiteboard in the first session. And uh, they told me it looked like a bento box and then they listened to me. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I just try to start coaching right away. Um, and then I also tend to start off with workshops. You know, my, all my workshops are, or most of them are private and there are cross-functional teams working on real opportunities. So I tend to set it up where you're learning these techniques, but you're doing it on real stuff that you care about. And I facilitate those. And then from there, I go into coaching if they need it afterwards. So I tend to like facilitate and right away, the first conversation, I try to uh, determine what ideas you want to test. Let's get the right people in the room and do some hands-on workshops together. Right now, like I said, I think we were talking before, uh, my last uh, in-person session was in Shoreditch on the book uh, in February of 2020. So all my sessions are now modules online using uh, Zoom, right? And I have Zoom producers that help me with breakout rooms and everything. Um, but basically all my online workshops are very much on real ideas. And then from there we do coaching afterwards if they need it. So that's kind of how I approach it. Um, doesn't mean it's right or wrong, but it sort of works for me. And I, uh, you see my style, it's very much facilitate and um, maybe not tell you exactly what to do, but help you reason it out for yourself. That's sort of how I approach things. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And we, uh, we will let you get to, uh, to the rest of your day. And it's just, uh, just kind of, you're, you're more towards the start of the day than, uh, yeah. than we are, but David, thank you. That was, that was awesome. And, um, I, and I've, I've read all of your stuff and I still learned a ton there. So thank you so much for taking the time to come and give back. 
uh, to uh, to the community uh, here in the UK and well and broader because uh, you know people can join from everywhere now. So uh, um, I'm looking at the comments and uh, everyone seems to have found that incredibly valuable. So much appreciated. Um, good luck. Um, well, I say good luck with the book. You don't need luck with the book. It's already awesome and uh, selling out. So uh, uh, good luck with the with the next ventures. I um, uh, uh, hope uh, and uh, I trust they'll be as successful as the as the current ones. Um, for the uh, for the meetup folk. Um, we have the, uh, the the irrepressible Mr. Richard Cheng uh, coming to speak to us next month. That is on the 25th of May. Don't miss that. Uh, he's always good fun uh, and you're going to learn a lot there. But um, um, otherwise, uh, thank you all for turning up. Thank you all for your engagement and your questions. That was awesome. And uh, I look forward to seeing you again next month. Uh, have a great night, everybody. Take care.